This week on The Breakdown, we talk to AB captain Sam Whitelock as they prepare for Ireland. We dissect a massive weekend of international rugby and Black Ferns coach Glenn Moore zooms in after another big loss to England. Kia ora koutou katoa, hello and welcome to The Breakdown. Plenty to discuss as always, seven days since all of the action happening across the globe. The All Blacks were in action as well. Plenty of international rugby to talk about. We shouldn't forget the Championship, the Premiership of NPC Rugby as well. So John Kerwin, Mills and Muliaina and Movember Mills has had his first shave. Mm. How are you feeling about it? A week in? Oh, I wasn't expecting this, but I'm quietly confident I'll get some more plenty more before the end of the month. So, shaped it on all this today. And, uh, yeah, I'll just say it's for a good cause, Millsy. Abs absolutely. Look <laughs> on the bright side, son. <laughs> <laughs> Go to nz.movember.com and search for Mills to make sure you donate and support what is a great cause. It's going to get better over time. We might even do extra breakdowns through the course of the season, <laughs> just so we get to see it. Just bring you back on. JK, let's focus pure and simply for a start on some of the All Blacks' performances on the weekend. We're going to talk about that in depth a little bit later on after Sam Whitelock. But are there some players who wake up after the game on the weekend and go, you know what, I might not get another game on this tour? Well, I'll be hopeful that they will, but I think the, the, the thing on reflection looking at that game, if you're Ian Foster, you're probably saying that was perfect. It was hard, it was tough. Um, the Italians were good, you've got to give them that defensively. And some, you, you don't, you're always wishful, but you have that knot in your stomach, Mills, you know, when you probably haven't performed like you want to, and you're thinking, I'm in trouble next week. How can you put it, he's trying to put a spin and an upside on this. For the Italians. Oh, for the Italians. Yeah. Like my Italian family, they're stoked. Uh, <laughs> Drove to four, Rome. Hold on, wait, wait. Mills, 47-9. 47-9 didn't concede a try. Are we being harsh? Overcritical? Oh, I think that that's... I don't think we'd be harsh. I think we're, when they look at it themselves and, and dissect it um, with Fozzy, I think there's a lot of areas in that game where they're very disappointed and um, they're frustrated in the breakdown, the, the, the places they actually went and targeted. Um, and also their skill set. You know, we're, we we. we the, the, their standards are high, and um, on the weekend they, they just they, didn't, they they weren't. So I think there'll be a lot of disappointed guys, but probably some excited guys that didn't play as well because you know um, they played fairly well against a Welsh outfit. So looking forward to this weekend. What are you pointing your play. finger at me for? What, what, what what's, you your your what's your favourite saying? You what? can't coach height or speed. Yeah, exactly. And you cannot actually coach what happened to the All Blacks on the weekend. That's why Ian Foster would be happy. They went out there, they got put under pressure, they struggled a wee bit, and they came up with solutions. He'll be sitting back going, that, how good? That's a former coach trying to find a way to look at a performance and find the best out of it. There's no doubt the All Blacks will take something out of their game on the weekend. They always do. I'm sure the Black Ferns will be looking at their performance this morning and looking for some solutions. Glenn Moore, the head coach, joins us now from across over in the Northern Hemisphere. And Glenn, I know there'll be disappointment from within the squad. What is the difference right now between your squad and your team and the English side and maybe the challenges coming up against France? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um... Yeah, look, we're, we're pretty disappointed yesterday, but, um, you know, we, we've also got to give credit to England that uh, are on top of their game right now. Um, you know, they've you know, played test matches uh, through the through the Six Nations and they've got a professional competition over here that um, is serving them well and, and have certainly uh, circulated a lot of uh, new players in amongst their experience. Um, and they've done that a year ago and, and uh, we're, we're at that point right now. I mean, you and I have coached together, mate. I know you'll be hurting, but I also know you'll be looking at it um, through your truth lens. Is it fitness as well? I mean, is, is the preparation... We're talking about this professional game next year coming in. Is one year going to be enough for us to get up to speed? Yeah, I think it is, JK. Um, you know, like, we've... Um, <coughs> we, 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 we've come over here and we know that we've got uh, players at three different levels based on what's been happening back at home in terms of uh, some players haven't been able to play for eight, nine weeks. Um, and, you know, we've been working really hard to manage those loads to ensure that we don't get any serious injuries as well, soft tissue injuries at least. And, um, you know, we're confident with uh, all the stuff that we're putting in place along with, you know, the start of the elite competition next year, that we will be in a far better place then. But, 
Look, I, I don't think it's overall in, in our conditioning right now. I think, um, you know, yesterday at halftime we were 10 penalties to four down and we know one of the English's strengths is kicking into the corners and wanting to maul to score and, you know, we've obviously got to do a lot of work around um, stopping these mauls, uh, which is exactly what we had to do in 2017. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm confident that we're going to get a lot better uh, and we'll be, by the time we get to next year, uh, we will We'll be where we need to be. Glenn, I, I know you've you changed you had two sort of totally different sort of outfits going out in the last couple of weeks, but you so you expose uh, these ladies to some test match footy which I've missed for a couple of years. But how do you keep them upbeat? This is this is massive in terms, especially the young the young girls, because how do you keep them, you know, positive? They're passionate, they're an upbeat sort of a group. Uh, but I suspect, you know, the mental side of it and keeping them focused would be a um, would be a, a big challenge at the moment. Yeah, well, look, we're, we're very much looking forward now. We'll obviously debrief uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday's match, um, and we always do that with absolute honesty. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue on with that. But, but look, I can tell you now, the troops are really upbeat. You know, we're looking forward to uh, getting to France. Well, I know we're going into a six-day turnaround, but, um, you know, we'll be upbeat. We'll be, we'll be ready to go. I mean, it's a, t it's a really tight group. It's a... It's, um, you know, the character of this group is exceptional and, um, you know, we've we've introduced, as you said, a lot of new players, a lot of young players, um, and some of, some of them had good performances yesterday. Glenn, the, the English managed to rebuild their side from a couple of years ago. They've had the Six Nations to perform. What's the biggest positive for you out of this young side you've got? We've seen you, you know, put a lot of debutantes out there, but what's some of the stuff that you're seeing that you think you can really work on? Well, look, a lot of those debutantes have got real talent. If you look at young um, Liana McKayley too yesterday, she was just she was exceptional. And you know, we're looking at some of the some of the numbers we collect on on uh, each individual off the GPSs and that uh, yesterday. And man, she was she was just exceptional. And you know, 19 years of age, and uh, she she had an impact on the game. And you know, so the so I think I think they're definitely going to get a lot better, and they're going to be a lot better for the experience. Look, uh, the great thing as well, a big stage, great crowds, great support. Hopefully what you're going to experience in New Zealand next year. Will it be similar when you go to France? What are you expecting over there and playing against them? Are they going to... Will they be similar in terms of challenge? Yeah, they play They play a little bit different. They're, they're a lot more unstructured and, um, and, and in all parts of their game, really. But, uh, you know, typical French, they have flair and, you know, you just got to make sure that you get on top of them uh, early, early in the piece. But in terms of uh, crowds and that, we'd probably expect uh, bigger crowds than what we've experienced here, and um, and there'll be a bit of heat on us for sure. Glenn, I know we're having a professional competition next year, Super Rugby. But does this further illustrate the need to have more competitions? You know, international competition like the Six Nations that, that they have. They've obviously got the, pre the Premiership, I think it is, but also a Six Nations or Championship type scenario where that where where our women can play in. Yeah, absolutely, Mills. Um, you know, we, we know a year ago we were we were destined to have eight test matches, which um, you know we we thought was the ideal build up leading leading to the World Cup, and uh, you know, unfortunately, we never got those. And and here we are, twenty six months down the track, and playing our first uh, our first test. So um, yeah, look, those those competitions, those uh, those levels uh, of competition internationally as well are really really important. Um, you know, we've got uh, we've got scheduled for next year a pack four with uh, the US, Canada, Aussie, and then um, home and away with Aussie a little bit later on, um, and that's that'll be all off the back of that you new know, elite competition. Um, you know, if I was being totally honest, I think we probably need one more in there, but um, you know, I think we've got a we've got a good base to work off, and and we'll certainly be in a lot better uh, condition as well. Look, you know what you're doing. You understand the challenges that are in front of you. Look, we know that this week as well, you'll continue to improve and get better. Uh, mate, thanks for joining us on The Breakdown. Good luck, and uh, hopefully it's all going to work out this weekend. Thanks, Glenn. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Well, the international game, the international window, was officially open. Yes, we've played another couple of test matches, but they were out of that. So the international teams, in theory, on the weekend, were to be at full strength. I know, for one, the Wallabies weren't.
We'll get to that a little bit later. But JK, the results on the weekend. You look around what happened in the Northern Hemisphere, some big results, some impressive performances. What was the biggest surprise for you? The result that of Japan. I didn't expect it to be that big, Mills. Um, and I'm concerned because I don't know a lot about uh, the Irish side, whether they've actually been rebuilding. You know, I think it was the end of an era when Joe went to the last World Cup. They got beaten by Japan, but it paid back. Uh, and then the Aussies, I didn't think they'd lose either. So those two. For you, Mills? Yeah, I think the, the Aussies, was, I thought they were building nicely. Uh, I know they're missing a couple of key... Key, key Quake Keeper and Samu Kurevi. Yeah, but this isn't. This, we, we spoke about how they're building some really good depth in, in other departments. They can't just rely on sort of Quake coming back. He wasn't even in the fold before the championship, so you've got to remember that. Who are they actually, you know, bringing bringing forth? So I was pretty surprised about um, them going down to Scotland. It must be something in, at Murrayfield or whatever, because they keep they keep losing to them there. But um, I was definitely surprised by that. that result. Oh, I think Scotland though are, are making progress, getting more consistent. JK, more competitive, well and truly in the Six Nations, showing signs. I like the way they play the game. I think this is a massive step forward for them and it is impactful for Australia because they started getting great momentum at the back end of the rugby championship. They're like that team at the moment that can't seem to get into a rhythm of the fact of winning games, particularly away from home, they sense to seem to struggle. Yeah, and look, I think that um, what Australia was missing was a first five that took control, Mills. And once Quaid came in and settled everyone well, so down... So how do you feel... I'm going to ask you to interrupt you quickly then. How do you feel about the fact then that they didn't manage to bring him from Japan? Him and Samu Karevi have gone to their club. This is an international window. You've coached in Japan. You've been in similar situations. How do you feel about the fact they weren't available or they weren't able to negotiate an opportunity for these guys to go and play on this tour? Well... Unless we start coming up with what the Irish do and give our players a tax break to stay in the countries, Quade Cooper's got to go and earn money. He wasn't involved. He this came in late. It's a season for them, though. Yeah, but at the end of the day, that's who's paying you the most exactly. money. We are, we, are actually, we are actually giving our players what, what I call financial sabbaticals. And that's OK. Bowden Barrett, Sam Whitelock, you know, Brody Retallick. So we, we are already doing that, but we're protecting... We're protecting the All Blacks, right? But Super Rugby suffers. So Quaid's got to go, my big boss has come to me and I'm earning a million bucks and he says, I want you at pre-season, then he's got to do pre-season. South Africa had their guys, though. They had their players, they take on Wales and they were back to strength mills. And South Africa did this, Malcolm Marks, late in the game. We know this is an all familiar picture for us, but South Africa, they are the team, we talk about Australia, they are the team that managed to go to the Northern Hemisphere and find ways to win. Yeah, they do, and they find it through their big forwards. It's sort of similar sort of types of styles, isn't it? They go out there, bring their big boys into the game. Close game, uh, but they certainly knew how to win. It's, it's, I mean, we sit here and we talk about the All Blacks, you know, you know, not playing very well, but winning by 47 points to, to nine. But we've, we've blooded some new blood. These other teams don't have yeah. that opportunity, and that's the luxury that New Zealand and the All Blacks you know, have these days. Well, uh, blooding new people, uh, maybe blooding new pitch invaders is what we need to do, because <laughs> I can't get over the fact that once again we experienced... This is a player that probably stopped... or Sorry, a fan that stopped Wales possibly scoring a try. Security has to come on the field. We've seen in the last two weekends... Someone's mate, Jarvo, this is last this weekend... He was on the field for Japan, and he was on the field the previous week for the All Blacks. JK, is this acceptable? Well, I think we should let them invade MMA next time and see what happens then. <laughs> Open That's the door of the I'll cage. Open reckon. the cage, and push him in. Go. go, son, <laughs> see how you go. Um, the, the saddest thing for me is with idiots like that, if I can be a bit rude, uh, taking it away from the seven- and eight-year-olds that we could let onto the pitch afterwards so that they can you know, touch their heroes and stuff like that. Um, the, the security needs to get better because, you know, I laughed at Java. I thought it was funny the first week. I didn't think it was funny this week. And that clown that ran on. And I felt sorry for the security lady that was running behind her who could have been cleaned up. I mean, someone's going to get injured. And so, yeah, the security just needs to get better. Who's responsible then, Mills? Oh, I think the home nation is, is responsible. I think, you know, idiots like that that come onto the, the field. But what's more, most frustrating is the way they've done it. It's, we've done it, we've done with ease. <laughs> they've basically just walked on there and the security guards sort of haven't even, haven't even noticed uh, the way they've jumped over the hoardings. I mean, this here, this idiot so, here, I mean, he's, he's, he's actually possibly could have cost his own team a try. And I know he got dished for it from the crowd, but 
at, at what stage? That, surely from the week before, the Welsh, the Welsh Union should have known, well, security's got to be really high this week. We can't assume that everyone's a friendly. We can't assume that everyone that's going onto the pitch is just there to have a bit of a fun and a laugh. And where does World Rugby then come into this, JK, in terms of sanctioning the host nation? Because it has happened in previous occasions. Whose responsibility is If this is football, what would FIFA do? This guy made a tackle for crying out loud. It was high too. It was <laughs> over the ship. It was a seatbelt tackle. He did wear a boot there. I, I mean, would not is, want him I mean, tackling me naked. No, this is absurd. That'd be horrible. That's that is absurd. absurd. But look, I think what we need to be able to do is and ban them forever. They should never be allowed to come to another rugby game because you do not want to be, and you've played Mills in Italy, where you've got 10 yeah. foot fences so the crowd can't get on. That's really sad. We don't want to see that happen. How in the world, after seven days later at Aviva Stadium, it's just happened at, in Cardiff, can the same individual... I mean, if this was any other sport in the world, Mills, his picture would be plastered everywhere. Going, There's only one guy that's not getting on the pitch today, and it's this guy. He must be getting help. Yeah, well, you, you think he, he is, obviously. He's just, he's just getting in there with ease. I mean, and what sort of, um, I suppose, what's happened? I mean, what's, what's, what's been his... What are they doing? How does he get, actually get in there? And what are the consequences for what he's done from the week before? Obviously none. So uh, it'd be sad if we were talking like this had, had a player been injured or someone had got been tackled, like you know, similar to, to what happened in South Africa when the referee got sort of taken out. I mean, we don't want to be talking about it. So yes, it's funny, but I think it's, it's come to a stage now where it's becoming ridiculous. Oh, I'm disappointed there hasn't been anything come out of world rugby in terms of saying that this is one unacceptable and sanctions against the nations that can't protect the players, the referees and those people who are involved in the contest. The health span let performer of the week for the All Blacks. Let's change it to a positive out of the weekend. You selected three. Here are your choices. The health span elite performer of the week, Richie Moanga, Dane Coles, Finlay Christie. I found this a surprise. JK, Richie Moanga has 47.6% of the vote. Are we being overcritical? Did we judge his performance maybe on the overall performance of the All Blacks? Or did we just take votes from Canterbury? <laughs> is that a possibility? No that one, is possible. No, no one else voted. That is possible. Um, you know, I, I, for me, Dane Coles was outstanding. And he was outstanding because in moments under pressure, he changed the game. So he was always going to get the most points. So I was a little bit shocked. I think, um, you know, I think, I think Richie played well, right? from a game point of view, but what we were looking for, I think from a tactical point of view, Mills, was for him to change the game plan, mm. which we didn't see happen. He might have, but from, from a distance. So I was always, I always thought Dane was way better. Yeah, a dominant performance, I think, was what we're after. I mean, but this is what Dane Coles did. He provided that, he was, uh, he got around the park, and more importantly, his, his key roles. I mean, you've got to remember, he's had limited sort of playing time as well, given that, that those, uh, the calf injury that he's had. But when it came to lineouts, you know, hit his lineouts, lineout drives when they needed it, and and man, they did need it because they had no points. You know, he he screwed it out and just scored a couple of nice nice tries. So in terms of his whole leadership um, and his core core role, he was he was quite outstanding. I love it when he focuses his anger into playing well, because his frustration came out the fact that he led. He led by the fact that they were making so many errors. That was the most impressive part for me, was the low error weight. Considering the number of errors that All Blacks were making, All Blacks were making, he didn't contribute to that. Does he put himself then, after that performance in the selection debate going forward, to the next Test match against Ireland? Remembering oh. they've got high hopes and he's been playing well in the likes of Samasoni Tokiaho. Against Ireland, no debate. He is on the bench. No debate. Who do you want coming on late? I want him coming on late. If he's fit, you see the acceleration he did from that mall? And those other guys, I mean, we have... Uh, uh, four really good We've ones. got four amazing, and these young men that have come yeah. in, they can be incredibly proud. But Ireland, over there, Aviva Stadium, I want my best heads out there. And I'd just put him... He'd be first on the bench. Yeah, and you, you know, you've seen that as well with, with the, the influence that Sam Whitlock had when he, when he came off the bench. I mean, he's, he's been managed well as Dane Coles. You know, he's now back to his, his best. They took him off uh, relatively early in, this, in that second half to, to give him that sort of break. So I, I agree, I think he's on the bench too. That was Ireland. Uh, sorry, that was Italy. This weekend, we take on Ireland. We've been doing our trivia questions, being connected to the test matches. JK is on a streak. 
Let's have a look at this week's question. Hi, do you believe I'm Deirdre and my question is, two Ireland players scored two tries in a test against the All Blacks. Who were they? Um, just a tip, JK, you played in one of those tests and Jeff, you played in the other. I should know one then. <laughs> I think Mills is the only one that's going to get this right. <laughs> he wasn't here in plan either Could, of those. Sorry, I Hold didn't on. quite understand the question. Can you just help me out? So two Irish players no. scored two tries and two tests. Was that the question? Scored a double. Is that, was that the question? That's what I'm asking. Can we play it again? We had trouble. Can, can we play it again? Can we roll it again? Let's roll it again. Let's roll it again because... I need. Hi, do you believe I'm Deirdre and my question is two Ireland players scored two tries in a test against the All Blacks. Who were they? Um, just a tip, JK, you played in one of those tests and Jeff, you played in the other. I've got it now. I've got it now. Leave us to ponder on that. <laughs> Leave us to ponder on that. We'll see you after the break. No, my hooky, my welcome back to the breakdown. The question was before the break, and we're trying to get it right. So, two Irish players scored a double against the All Blacks. I played in one of the test matches, and so did Sir John Kerwin. So, JK wanted to go first. I have absolutely no <laughs> idea. I have no idea. None, none whatsoever. I, I, I think I can remember the game, that's about it. And mine was over, it was over 20 years ago, so... Athletic Park, the old Athletic Park, I'm thinking. But we beat them 50-something. And, and we, uh, did you score in the game? Yeah. I oh, know I scored the tries, two tries in the game, but I don't know who scored yeah. against I us. scored two I, that day. Uh, so I did say I think you'd get it. Well, was Keith Wood one? I think Keith Ooh, Wood is one. Nice. I think Keith and, Wood is um, one. I don't know, Deirdre someone? <laughs> <laughs> What's the answer? Let's give us the answer. Give us the answer, please. And the answer is Vince Cunningham in 1992 and Keith Wood in 1997. I... You know, the sad thing, I think I might have marked Vince. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I told you I didn't tackle. I, d I did remember, I, I did, I did, I, I just couldn't, I don't know why I couldn't remember Keith Wood's name. Oh, look. Well, uh, send in your entries to the breakdown at sky.co.nz. Test us. That was a great question. Great question. Really. That was a great, great question. question that well and truly tested us. We've got a few weeks left yet, so please send them in anything you would like. Well, I would have to say, though, we're going to change tact here because over the last seven or eight days, the topic of con concussion in and around rugby has come to the fore once again after Carl Heyman announced that he was diagnosed with perhaps the onset of early dementia. And so, you know, I think this is an area in the game that has been bubbling away. World Rugby are dealing with, at the moment, a large conversation with a group of players who are taking action, wanting to get some answers in and around maybe the effects. We saw already over the weekend Dane Haylett Petty, a Wallaby who was just at 31, age, age 31 years old. He has announced his retirement after the effects of concussions that he has suffered in recent times. So it's now time to dig a little bit deeper into this, and we've brought Danielle Salmon from the Otago University. Welcome to the show. You are working in conjunction with not only New Zealand rugby, but world rugby on a study and collecting data. It's been reported already. This data, this information you get, what is it you're hoping to deliver to both the game in New Zealand and to world rugby, and when would you like to deliver it? Yeah, so no, we're um, looking at a, we've been running for the, this community season, we've been capturing data with um, 28 different teams in New Zealand, ranging from the under 13s through to the senior club level. And what we've had the opportunity to do is to work with, you know, Otago Rugby Union, the University of Otago, the Otago Polytechnic, and kind of as a group come together. And what we've done is we've captured kind of at minimum about four games and four trainings with um, each of those teams and uh, levels from the under 13 to the senior in both men's and women's. So what we've kind of starting to do with this data is to really understand with instrument and mouth guards and um, video data is um, 
where these impacts are happening in the game and um, how these impacts differ from, you know, our little under 13s up to our senior men's and women's and, and how certain factors like their age, their playing experience, you know, um, their previous history of concussion, how these factors play into the impacts that they experience. So hopefully we finished our data collection with our rep U16 team two weeks ago. So hopefully we've got all the instrumented mouth guard data. Now we're just going through the process of verifying it, that mouth guard data with videos. So we can see whether, you know, it was a tackle, um, the impact happened to tackle or a breakdown, or, you know, if it's a player sticking to the sock or chewing on it. So we'll video verify that and then start to have that picture. So hopefully we should be finished the video verification by about Christmas time, and then hopefully be able to kind of speak to some reports and some of the data in the start of the year. Obviously, you would have been looking at some of the early data. Is there any parts of the game that are showing um, early signs of possibly being more dangerous than other parts of the game? Um, the, kind of the interesting thing, and this is just speaking from a very high level, we know at the kind of the semi-professional professional aspect of the game is a lot of the big impacts tend to happen in the tackle. But what we're seeing kind of at initial crack is that these big impacts that we're seeing actually are spread throughout the game. Um, you know, they're not just isolated to the tackle. We tend to see them in, in more aspects of the game than I think we'll see at the semi-professional professional side. Danielle, I want to talk about, because obviously, you know, this is a contact sport and there's no getting away from these aspects of the game that you're just going to have to um, bear in terms of the contact, but is, is there recommendations in there in terms of the recovery of the guys? And I mean, I'm talking in particular the HIA system that they've got where they test uh, guys before, the, before the, um, the tournaments and also when they've come off the field in the, in the professional arena. Yeah, so I know um, there's different. So at the community level, we have we do have a 21, 23 day stand down period um, in around you know your age bracket. But kind of at the professional level, potentially there you, you do have an opportunity to return within seven days. You know, under the supervision of a, a qualified doctor, if you know certain criteria have been met. Um, and I think kind of the interesting thing about this impact data is potentially it could really help supplement what's happening with once we get a better understanding of where these impacts are happening we we do know we have a sideline pitch doctor who tries to pick up any big events um, they can relook at that video and if they suspect a player's displayed some symptoms they can pull them off but potentially you know this is talking um, down the future is if we have these players in instruments and outguards, this data could help say, oh, you know, number 10 had a bit of a big impact. Let's, you know, let's look at the footage. Oh, he seems to be doing not so great. Well, we can pull him off and get an assessment done. But at this stage, we probably don't know enough to fully understand what these impacts mean. But I think, you know, that's a really exciting piece is this could help inform that HIA and expedition to make sure that, you know, there's nothing that is missed. I mean, the other, are there other contributing factors, I mean, when it comes to concussion? I mean, do people experience concussion in, in everyday life? And are they things that we don't understand and I suppose need to explore in connection with the game? Yeah, well, no, I think that's the critical piece to the puzzle is concussions happen in all aspects of life. You know, if we look at overall in New Zealand, I think only about 40% of our concussions actually happen in sports. So, you know, it's not just, you know, a rugby thing or a sport thing. It's, you know, how do we look after anybody who sustained a concussion? But we do know from some of the research that's been out there is that, you know, your genetics play a really important part. Some people, you know, you could hit upside the head with a two by four and they're fine. Whereas some people, you know, just having their head in the wrong place at the wrong time and it really impacts them. Um, we know potentially there is a difference between male and females we know the neck uh, the cervical spine of women is different from men so that may impact on you know the number of concussions they experience potentially you know there's differences in neck strength and neck size between men and women um, we know that if you have a you know a history of mental health issues potentially that seems to be um, you're more likely to suffer from kind of having a prolonged recovery from a concussion and there's also you know other things you know potentially recreational drug use, how much alcohol you drink that um, play a history as well as, you know, um, lifestyle choices such as, you know, obesity, all those things tend to have an impact on, you know, concussions and potentially a risk of those. 
You, you've obviously got an understanding of the game of rugby union. From your initial research and your experience and what you've seen in data, you've been around this game. Do you feel as though, once you've put everything together, that rugby will look at some aspect and make some sort of change to protect its players? Yeah, and I think that's a really exciting piece is actually, you know, World Rugby and New Zealand Rugby, um, you know, with support of, you know, the University of Otago and these other entities is really owning the fact, okay, you know, concussions are a risk and we know that, you know, a lot of people are making choices not to participate because, you know, this fear of concussion. Well, really what we need to ensure is that concussions, you know, it's not just a sport thing, but really by understanding where these impacts happen and potentially what factors contribute to, can we look at, you know, how we coach kids, potentially look at rule changes, um, you know, put regulations in around what training looks like, how much, how much time are you allowed to do live contact? You know, is that limited to once a week, 20 minutes, or, you know, looking at um, some really big impacts we've seen from people just hitting bag work. So looking at, do we have to put regulations in around that um, as well? So I think really having this data will really help us really understand where those impacts are happening and, you know, what we can do from a prevention standpoint to make the game as safe as we can to ensure that people have the opportunity to play and enjoy it as safely as possible. Danielle, keep up the great work. We look forward to hearing about your findings and what New Zealand Rugby and World Rugby do with the information. Thanks for joining us on The Breakdown. No worries. Thank you very much for having me. Well, of course... Can, I ask, can I ask a dumb question of you, of both of you, so when I've got a minute? You can ask a question now if you'd like. What would you like to know? What actually happens to the brain when you get concussed? Do we know? I was going to ask, but I felt stupid. So I didn't. So I thought I'd ask you because you know I'm stupid. Well, I, well, I mean, I, look, I, I know for for a fact when when it happened to me significantly, like I got knocked out and and I woke up in the changing room. At that point in time, it was the mandatory three weeks stand, stand down. You know what? No, what I mean, what yeah, happened in the head? In the head? Yeah. So it's, it's a great question. I'm not a medical doctor, mm. um, but what I do look at for me, I start looking at the number of players that we're experiencing in recent times who are retiring their careers early for the fact they haven't been able to recover. James Parsons, Ben Afiaki, just to name a couple. Craig Clark, I know, was the same. They weren't able to recover uh, Mills. Is the game now, do we look at it and go, you know what, is it significantly different in terms of the number of contacts? Where do you see issues? Do you think, on the back of information like this, rugby might have to make a change? Well, first and foremost, I think it's great that they're actually doing a study on that because there's no doubt um, that the impact, the type of player, the physiques of, of these guys are a lot better than when we, when we played. So they absolutely need something to try and stop that. I suppose where I'm um, sort of more concerned at is, is the parent. From when you put your parent hat on, you talk about your 13-year-olds and your parents that are sitting at home thinking, well, these guys are... It's all about concussion. You know, I coached this year an under 13s team, and they, they didn't even tackle all. They wanted to run backwards, you know, including my son. So how do you how do we implement things to, to make sure? You've got, I, one, of I, I see that you got one of those sons too. Yeah. It's the same. And so, What's up with that? You don't I, want I to, used to do like father, like, like son. To be fair, I mean, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's be honest. You don't want the parents to be put off yeah. by that. So what what can we sort of implement in terms of the younger generation or the younger kids, so then you know that, that it is safe for them, that, that it's safe for the parents to be able to give them confidence. You know, to, to, to have their kids play the sport because that's what we want. If, we, if that dies off, then we're, we're sort of battling it and everything. But I, I like the fact that they've gone out and done something. Look, I think we need to minimise the number of collisions in context. I'm going to, and, and this is what I've thought for a while, what's changed for me significantly is the contest at the breakdown. Look, the number of players that used to get in over the ball and jackal were two. Both teams had a seven and that was it. Now you've got 30 players, to me, who put themselves in a position that is vulnerable. Head down collision over on the ball, not over the ball, on the ball. And to me, I think this is an area of the game which, one, is confusing to referee, but also, I think it's that repetitive nature of that. Constant, constant collisions, heads going down and over the ball. I've thought for a while, to me, that you can still have a contest to the breakdown, but it should be for the space over the ball. It shouldn't be on the ball, people going down, not keeping their heads up. Now, a lot of people go, oh, that would change the game, but it never used to be part of the game. Mm. You used to win the ruck and the breakdown, JK, by going past it, by getting numbers past the ball. What we've got at the moment is, to me, it's this gladiatorial mindset of every single player putting their head down in a position, and I think it's contestable to the point where it's dangerous. I think it, there won't be one solution, but I also like what Mills said before. Our athletes now are huge, right? I think Offa Tugan Fussy does like 180 kilos on the bench, you know? I used to do that squatting. Um, so... 
We talked about fatigue in the game. We talked about it now being an anaerobic game instead of an aerobic game, which does two things. You have to be big to play this game. I mean, the halfbacks now are as big as we used to be, right? Um, so what we need to be able to do is, if we put fatigue in, and this would have to be tested, so that you don't have changes, is that going to heighten the risk mills? Because you, when you're tired, you're a bit more sloppy and bound stuff. So there'll be some stuff that we'll need to implement that won't be simple, and it shouldn't be something where we go, let's look at this solution over the next few years. Let's do something very quickly, and I agree with you in the ruck, but then also keep looking at it. But the part that I found interesting is that they tried lowering the tackle in the, the UK. They ran competitions, and they found that the number of concussions actually went up yeah. because they brought everybody down. So there's no easy solution, but I like the fact the research has been done, the study has been done, and I think that space needs to be explored to protect not just the players who are now, but our future players of the game. After the break, we catch up with Sam Whitelock as they prepare for Ireland in the Northern Hemisphere. But first, it's time to look at our All Access for this week on Thursday night. It's the captain of the Black Ferns, Les Alder. Girls across the Bay of Plenty look to this jersey and, and they say, I want to be a part of that. Go inside the four walls of Bay of Plenty's leader. As a mum to a young girl, that teaches her that she can do anything as well. From Monday... You've got to find the balance of everything to game day. I have to show up, and that's my mentality. You know how big this game is? Let's go. One, two, three, one, two, three, fire! All Access, Les Elder. Premieres Thursday, Sky Sport 1. Welcome back to The Breakdown. The All Blacks, they take on Ireland. It is 4am on Sunday morning. We will be here in studio. This man, the All Black captain, Sam Whitelock, will be there as well. I want to ask first and foremost, so Sam, how did the team react immediately after the game against Italy? Yeah, good day, everyone. Um, awesome to be on. I think the feeling in the sheds afterwards, um, it was kind of split a little bit. Um, some of the boys obviously wanted to play better and they knew they should have and, and they probably uh, wanted to. Well, they, they definitely wanted to. And that's always hard when you kind of have that mixed feeling of, you know, happy that we, we had a good win, but at the same time, we didn't play the way we wanted to. And, and that's the cool thing about this team. We're always looking to get better and, and grow and evolve and, and chasing uh, some different things. Sam, the, the, the Italians were good defensively and I've, I've always wondered... Um, you know, I'm, I'm so old, we didn't have replacements, but something you're not used to, but what did you try and bring to the game when you came on from the bench? Yeah, I thought Italy were outstanding defensively. They put us under heaps of pressure, especially around the breakdown. And, you know, like they overcommitted to it and they slowed us down and that, you know, got us out of our structure. And I think, well, as you can see on the, the footage at the moment, you know, they had guys over the ball, they were slowing us down. And it made it hard for our, our nines to clear the ball and we didn't have the space and time we wanted to. So for myself, coming off the bench, um, I've done it quite a few times. I played my first, I think, nine off the bench. So I just wanted to make sure I was nice and calm watching the game and didn't want to burn any energy uh, being a spectator. And then when I got out there, I just knew that I had to do my, my role. So whether that was carrying the ball or um, sorting out the breakdown or whatever it was, just had to do that at, at 100%. Sammy, you're, you're in Ireland now. I mean, they're looking like a totally different Irish team here. They're looking like they're, they're playing a little bit more expansive. Does that excite uh, yeah, now your, your team, given that you guys can, can play that sort of footy? Yeah, they had an awesome game in the weekend. Um, I think the score was 60 to 5 against, uh, against Japan. So it just shows that they can play. And um, they've got the individuals to play an expansive game. They've got um, some legends of the game coaching them with, say, a Paulie O'Connell. So their set piece is really good as well. Um, it's something for us to, we're going to have our review uh, in about an hour or so, um, looking back at Italy and then we'll definitely look forward to the challenges that are involved with Ireland and you know, we only need to look back at the last 10 or so years about the close games we've had, the wins and the losses, so um, the boys are definitely ready to go. Sam, it's end of the year tour, always difficult, fatigue comes into it, I think you've probably got the mental fatigue of such a hard year with you know, MIQ or lots of things happening. Do you change things in these last two weeks? Can you train a little less? I mean, how do you manage those situations? I think for myself, uh, like I've had an eight-week period of I was just getting flogged in the gym um, by the trainer because obviously I couldn't get, get back to the team. So for myself and a couple of other guys that come over late, we're feeling great. We, uh, if anything, want to ramp it up. But it's something that we've got to 
judge day to day, but the energy levels are really good. The boys are excited about finishing strong rather than limping across the line. Um, but the main thing with that is we'll go back to this week. Uh, this week is the most important thing and breaking it down to day by day things, um, which makes it really easy to set a goal and get to that goal and, and then move on. And that's something that I believe this team's really good at is when we break it down into achievable parts, we can do it. And then when we get back to MIQ, we can deal with that then. It's, it's been a long tour, Sam, you know, for a lot of these young guys as well, sort of like no other. I mean, how do you how do you deal with that sort of you know, mental fatigue when you know you've just mentioned that MIQ now is shortened a little bit, so that might give you some hope. But also, does does Gilbert sort of you know um, deal with these young guys to make sure that they're, they're coping in terms of the the length of this whole tour because it has been a very long time. Yeah, I think everyone's different. Um, I think at the start of the tour, obviously I wasn't here, but the boys did some great work around putting a plan in place of what the whole tour looked like, and then breaking it down into different parts. And actually playing is, is pretty easy because you're learning moves, you're working on certain things uh, throughout our game as a team individually. So you've actually got heaps of time to um, do things and, and you've got heaps of work to, to do. And that's actually easy because you're busy and you don't have time to sit around the hotel and think about family and, and things at home. So I think that's what uh, has set this team up really well so far and that's something that we definitely don't want to change going forward, especially for this week. Sam, just lastly, look, it wasn't the performance you're looking for on the weekend, but that happens from time to time, and, and I'm sure Ian Foster would have looked at that and said there's some things that everyone learned. But it appeared as though, up to that point, the group itself was really enjoying their rugby, enjoying your way you were trying to play. Do you get that sense? Because from time to time, it does beget, become monotonous, the, the routine. But it seems as though there's a real enjoyment within the group. Is that the sense that you got the moment you step back into the environment? Yeah, the enjoyment there is, is massive and you could see it when the boys were scoring tries and, and celebrating things that people have done uh, in the game, whether it was a big tackle or a turnover. And I, I think that's critical for us as All Blacks when we're having fun, enjoying our, our rugby. It shows in the way we perform. So, um, And it's normally built through throughout the week around the hard work and the preparation of the process to, to get to the game then the game becomes e easy as you know, all three of you guys know, when you have a great week, all of a sudden the game is the easy part because you're looking forward to that challenge, you have a great plan in place and you can go out there and, and execute it. And when the All Blacks have been at their best this year, you've been fantastic. Good luck. It's a unique experience in Dublin against Ireland. Play well. Thanks for joining us on the show. Awesome. Cheers, guys, and uh, keep up the good work. I'll tell you what... He looks so comfortable in his own role as the All Black captain, JK. I think that's what impressed me the most, that he missed that time with the All Blacks in the Rugby Championship, but it's been seamless. I think, I think his, his role in that team now is absolutely critical for them going forward. It was really interesting because when I asked him about coming off the bench, I noticed the change when he got on there. And I know he's going to do his roles. But I just think he's this amazing leader now. I just think he is... Um, you see him on the field making decisions, Mills. And it started at Eden Park when... Who was in the bin? Can't remember now. Someone was in the bin and they slowed it down and he kicked it to the corner and took shots at goal. And he was just like a natural. So, yeah. you know, it's going to be really interesting moving forward because I think he's the best guy moving forward to be kept. Uh, he seems refreshed as well, doesn't he? He seems really refreshed in terms of the time he's sort of had off and he's brought in... He hasn't sort of came in... It has been seamless, but he's brought another level. And how good is that when you, when you strip everything back and think about the young locks that we've got to provide and also Josh Lord, who I thought had a great game as yeah. well. I mean, how, how impressive is that when you've got someone like Sam Whitelock at the best of his game? And, and in particular, too, because, you know, Retallick, you know, under, under an injury cloud, he could be out. So I think it's, it's amazing the way he's playing and the, the way he's been playing, too, considering how many games he's played for the All Blacks. So 140 odd, he'd probably become the, the most test All Blacks uh, sometimes soon. So outstanding. So they'll do the review, JK. You look at the squad that played against Wales, which was impressive. Played incredibly well. Ireland, though, on the back of eight. Strong performance against Japan. Dominant performance. Do you see the All Blacks making any changes other than injury enforced if Brodie Retallick isn't able to play? Is that Tupo Vai? And what other things might they look at or consider for this, particularly around halfback? Brad Wepper, after a big knock on the weekend, might not be available. I think they'll go back to TJ. I think TJ played 
incredibly well against Wales. I thought he brought that tight game. So he's good when they're picking and going. So that's a big part of his game. I was a little bit worried about the speed of delivery. Um, the thing I like about this current selection panel is they're picking on form. And I think they'll make some changes if they have to. Um, but I can't see too many changes, to be fair, uh, from the Wales game. So, no, I can't Mills, see what would you see? Any considerations? Maybe David Harvey probably hasn't been at his best in his last couple of test matches. Did Quintapaya do enough uh, on the weekend to say, you know what, I deserve a start? Yeah, I think... I don't think the, the starting 15 would be, be too many changes. I think David Harvey still you know, merits you know, starting the combination with him and Anton Leonard Brown is, is, uh, is, is coming together really nicely. I think it'll be all on the bench. Does a Quintupaya, you know, get that opportunity? You agree, Dane Coles? I think uh, Dane Coles comes comes onto the bench as well, so it's it's the makeup of that. I think uh, and anything else. I think the starting lineup will stay the same. I'm not worried about the backs. I don't know what they're going to do at loose forward, because against Ireland, do you actually play a bit more of expansive game and put a kitter back in? It's a great question. Uh, look, I, I look at it. It was a go, question. It was, it was a question. I, I, look, I, I would stick exactly with the combination they've had. I really like what we've got going on, particularly with Artie at number eight. I think he's been a standout performer this year. Once again, his leadership has grown. You know, um, Offer to Angafasi, I'm assuming, will be available for selection, so whether he comes onto the bench. Do we still continue the fact no Damien McKenzie on the bench? Do we just stay with Richie Mwanga? Or do they make a change at first five? That ever that debate that we continue on. JK, I, I just look at this and go, you know what? It seems to me as the guys have cleared out a little bit in terms of it seems a lot easier to write down some of these names, which we weren't sure about probably three or four months ago. Well, I mean, the, the one you've spoken about, you know, obviously the Cantabrians have voted for uh, <laughs> Richie. But, I mean, would you write Bowden Bout straight down now and go, yep? After, I think after that last support performance, definitely. You know, I, I was a big uh, Richie, uh, you know, starting Ireland against the Welsh team, but the way he's performing has come on. They, that five weeks of of, uh, of starting for the All Blacks has really aided in terms of um, you know Bowden Barrett getting up to the level that he left bef that he left before he went to to Japan. So he's definitely first for me. I do really like too what Finlay Christie did uh, coming off the bench early in that game against Italy. He shows the signs of a guy who's maturing in the environment as well, uh, uh, J.K. Because I think just he just seems to he understands how how to have an impact on the game and his role. Yeah, and look, I think if you're playing T.J. Um, then this guy can come on and really make a difference. He's really impact. For me, he's a little bit like, you know, Damien. We don't know if, you know, I, I think they'll put Mwanga on the bench, so I don't think McKenzie will make it. But this kid can come on and make a difference. You know, tiredness late in the game mills, the, you know, the, the props are getting tired. He can come in there and really change the pace of the game and I think that's a good contrast between TJ and him. Yeah, they're two different players, aren't they? And with, if, if we be easier, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you, you started Chris, I think he's he's fairly comfortable there. If he started and brought TJ on to play that more sort of, you know, um, a physical game around the ages or vice versa, it doesn't really matter because of the, you know, the different sort of styles that they, both players had. That's Sunday morning in the middle of the night. The Bunnings NPC, however, has got its semi-finals coming up this weekend. It's been decided, and this is the Premiership. Hawks Bay are on top. They are taking on Tasman. Waikato are taking on Canterbury. Canterbury were getting written off a few weeks ago. Reuben Thorne has turned that team around, and who would put it past them challenging for another title? Taranaki take out the might of Southland. Manawatu take on <laughs> Otago. Southland getting the all-important win over Northland two weekends ago. So this is. Are you still getting free oysters? To look, what, uh, I about? hope so. I'm getting free oysters after this. Manawatu Otago, Taranaki Southland. There's the, all the home teams are on the left. They're all the North Island teams. All the South Island teams are going on the road to Palmerston North, Inglewood, Napier, and Rotorua. Southland, the biggest upset will be on the weekend. I've got all faith in what's going to happen. Righto, team. Who's playing in the finals? Not this weekend, but next. You've seen it. There they are. I'm staying to the left of your screen. All the home teams? Yep, exactly. So I'm going all to the left. Oh, I'm to the left until you get to the Wakato Canterbury game. Well, I'm not too sure because it's away too. Well, it's home, but it's away in Rufa Rua for, for Wakato and, and Canterbury. I don't, no, we can't ah, trust Canterbury. No. We can't trust Canterbury. And like, I suppose it's one of those seasons when you're thinking you're Taranaki and your Hawks Bay, you've had such strong years. No, they'll play okay. what you just said in the change room. They you won't play. trust Canterbury. What's they, that? They, they will play that in the change room. They're not using that for motivation. They know what they're doing. They're 100% knowing 
and what they're doing. No. But what it is, too, back to back games, Taranaki playing Southland. So Southland know what to expect, Inglewood. <laughs> Great ground, that, on a good day. Look, it was fantastic on the weekend. They've got nothing to play for, have they? What have they got to play for? What do you mean, Southland? Wait, they in it. Semi. It's a title. They're going for a title. They they you've got like... no faith. You've got no faith. Come on now. Can we, see an, can we see an upset anywhere? If there's going to be an upset, I'm saying South can pull off an upset. Oh, I think Millsy's right with the Canterbury. I think Canterbury Waikato is probably their closest. I think the other, the other sides are, well, it is playoffs, so who knows? But I think that last one, the Waikato game, is. Can anyone see an upset in Dublin? Oh. No. <laughs> you don't want to talk about that? No, you don't want I don't to want discuss to that? No, you don't I want don't to discuss even want to think that? about it. It's 4 a.m. on Sunday morning. We'll be here. Will he be saying it then that I think this game, this will be close? This will be a contest? I think we'll win, but yeah, let's hope not. Let's hope that um, we don't lose, but I think we'll win. What we're hoping for is in seven days' time that Movember Mills has got stronger, that we're seeing some positive growth. Get online, go to movember.co.nz, search them out, Mills Mulioina, and make sure you support what is. He's representing the breakdown. Thanks for joining us tonight, and to everyone that was on the show, great insight, and we'll see you, yes, we'll be back in seven days' time. We're just excited about another opportunity of taking on a great team. Uh, Test footy is, uh, comes down to one or two chances. Drop kick coming up. And he gets it through Dan Carter. And uh, they win the Test match. Conceded the way we did at the end is very, very disappointing. Here's Coles. What a pass! What a pass! And the kick for the 100% record. He's nailing it. Well, he picks it up quickly and off he goes. Drops it off to Henshaw! Robbie Henshaw scores it! Rugby history! Ireland beat the All Blacks for the first time! Oh, well, it is the biggest game. That it's one versus two. Oh! Stockdale. Now the race is on!